After the four o'clock news and weather on BBC Two, Paul Coyer and Brian the Computer have more brain teasers in another round of Catchword. Hello there, good afternoon, and welcome to Children's BBC for Friday, which is a good day, of course, because it's the weekend tomorrow. Bit of time off, <laughs> a bit of a lie-in. Actually, I don't. Take it up and go watch Going Live on Saturday mornings. How are you? Are you well? I hope so. I'm, I was going to... Ah, here it is. This is what I was going to read out. Um, Andrew Lee, who is three and a half, has sent me a picture of his sore toe here, and he says it's my fault. He says because he came running in because Children's BBC started on the telly, he fell over in the lounge onto his toe, so I should, apparently should say sorry, Andrew. Well, I'm terribly sorry. I hope your toe gets better. What's going on down here exactly? I'm playing at today. Uh, it's a good day today. Corners is on in a moment. It'll be followed at five past four by the Ewoks. There's the amazing sat satellite show at 4 <laughs> 4.30. News round is at five o'clock and at five past five, a whole heap of stuff as usual in record breakers, including the search for the elusive number eight. Details later at the top of the list, Joe and Corners. <laughs> me please uh, there's a question from Zoe White here who wants to know who invented the spoon knife and fork oh. I thought you might have a friend who might know that um, knives and forks yeah I think I can help you with it great <laughs> oh so mm -hmm. be machines out of order I'm afraid sorry oh no well Joe I'll leave the letter there and you answer the question by the end of the program okay thanks but, but, but Sophie it's not it's not what oh dear better get to work I suppose here we go uh, ah! oh dear oh my goodness are you all right do you know what this is, and what's it showing? Well, this piece of technical apparatus is called an oscilloscope. And how it works is that uh, sound waves are picked up by the microphone, which converts them into electrical signal, which is shown up on this screen here. Now, with an oscilloscope, we can actually see what different sorts of sound waves look like. Now, if I speak quietly, you can see there's just a little trace. But if I shout more loudly, you can see there's a much bigger trace. Now, when I speak, it looks a bit like a jumbled mess. That's because speech is a very complicated sound. I mean, it goes up and down and around and around, and when you take a breath, and that shows here. But if I whistle, you'll see a much simpler pattern. That's because whistling is a much more even sound. Now, if I alter the pitch of my whistle, you will see how that pattern changes. As the pitch of my whistle went higher, the sound waves got closer together. So an oscilloscope uses electrical signals to show us sound waves. <laughs> oh, thank you, Sophie. That's very kind of you. Oh, Steve, I wasn't applauding you, no, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking about a question we've had from Ruth Hartley, and she wants to know, after a concert, why does everybody clap their hands? Well, if you're sitting in a large audience, then your smiles and other signs of approval can't be seen by the performers on stage. And naturally, you want to make a nice, big, loud reaction to something you enjoy. So people save it all up until the end. And nobody knows for sure why applause is the thing that's used, but a clap is a very good way of making a big, loud noise. And all over the world, they do it in different ways. For example, in Panama, they tap the back of their thumbnails together like this. <laughs> and would you believe, in ancient Rome, they used to flap their togas? Now, now, now Sophie, don't get into a flap. <laughs> flap, you get it. Right, uh, I've got some good environment pictures here. Um, oh, and I must say, um, a few weeks ago, I remember I asked you to send in some pictures of how you would like your environment to be. And uh, I've got these here, like uh, this one here from uh, Moanzi Callis. And she says, um, I live in a maisonette and there's a farm on the other side of the road, so I'd like some shops. And she's drew some pictures of some shops, what she would like. And uh, we've got this one here from uh, Alistair Heron, and he comes from Northern Ireland. And he reckons that all houses should have 
seven floors, and that there, there should be money trees and a gun. I think that's a good idea. His own private spaceship and a volcano, so at least you'd have the warmest house in the street. And uh, this one here I really like, and this is from Ben Steele, and he lives up in Edinburgh. And uh, he would like to have a post box which had a very long hand that would go up to his bedroom, get the letters and post them for him. He sounds like a very lazy lad. <laughs> I think it's a brilliant idea, Steve. <laughs> hey, I wonder what Joe's perfect environment would look like. I don't know. Uh, Joe? What would your perfect corner look like? Good, lovely. Hey? Oh, um, in, okay, I'm too busy at the moment. Hang on. Right oh. now, take a deep breath. Here we go. Lovely. Oh, well, never mind. We'll ask him later, shall we? Hey, here's a good question, Steve, mm -hmm. from Carl McCallum, who wants to know, how does the pool table know that the white ball is coming so it makes it come back and the coloured balls don't come back? Well, I know the answer to that one, because I went to Pickett's Lot Sports Centre to find out why. Yeah, clever clog. I know. Oh, do you want to see why the white ball comes back? Yes, please. Well, have a look at that. Unfortunately, the cue ball always comes back. How's that? Is the table fiendishly clever? I mean, how does it know? Well, it's dead easy. The white ball is an eighth smaller than any of the other coloured balls on the table. So, let's have a look inside, shall we? <coughs> right. When a coloured ball goes down the hole, it runs along the inside and comes out here. When a white ball goes down the hole, it runs along the inside and comes out here, but it falls through. And that's how you get your white ball back. There you are, Joe. Hooray! Thanks, Soph. Shall we give it a go now? Yeah, okay. Right, a bangly cattlery letter in there. Okie dokie. Right. Then press button B. Right. Right, is it working? I think it is. Yeah! We've done it, Soph. I'll just check the picture, all right? <laughs> here we go. Hello. What we'd like to know is, why do bats hang upside down? But, but hang on, you're not cutlery. No, but I know who they are, Joe. And they're Monks Mead First School. And um, I was going to answer that question later, but I'll do it now, eh? Stupid thing, I said cutlery, not bats. Oh, righty. Oh dear, I hope it's not damaged. Oh dear. <laughs> -na 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 Batman. Now, there are many good reasons why bats hang upside down. One of them being that it's much easier for them to just leave their perches and fly off into the air rather than having to struggle up from the ground. And another being that there are many more predators on the ground and so it's a lot safer to be hanging upside down in the air. And another reason is that it's much easier for bats to groom themselves when they're hanging upside down. Now, to actually handle bats, you need to have a bat licence. And luckily, we've got somebody who's got a bat licence with us in the studio today. Shirley Thompson. Hello. And Nora. Nora Batty, the real one. <laughs> Nora's beautiful. She's all soft and lovely. Now, you were telling me earlier that bats are the only mammals that have the full power of flight. That's right. Their hands have evolved to become wings. You can see this is the thumb here. But their long fingers are joined by a skin-like membrane, which goes right down to their ankles. The thumb is used for grasping, but it's not very good for hanging. So you can see that the hind feet are very much better. She's got quite sharp claws. That she's that's claws right. With. And they can hold onto a very fine surface, too. That's fantastic. Well, that's a few reasons why bats hang upside down. Thanks very much, Shirley. Thank you. And, of course, thank you, Nora. Joe, are you sure your legs are strong enough to hang on? Well, actually, uh, my be uh, legs are beginning to ache a little bit, actually, Stephen. Well, take it easy, Joe. Uh, in fact, I, do you know, I, I think I'm going to fall. No, no, no. Ah! Oh! Joe, are you all right, Joe? Uh, uh, oh. Yeah, I'm fine. 
Oh, look, it's working now. <laughs> well, I knew you'd mend it, Joe. At last, my big chance to use Joe's beam machine. Oh, I can see a table, but I can't see the knife and spoons. Uh, just a minute, I think somebody's coming. What's going on? What's the delay? Something missing, is it? I might have guessed. Knife, fork, spoon, fold, eh? Here, Sarge. Here, Sarge. Here, Sarge. Get up here, you horrible little pieces of cattle right at the devil. Oh, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, attention. Late on duty again, get to your places at once. Yes, Sarge. Yes, Sarge. Yes, Sarge. Sorry, Sarge. White wanted to know who invented the spoon, knife and fork, as she has always wanted to know. Invented us? Cheek, I call it. <laughs> We've always been here. People couldn't eat without us. Well, uh, people couldn't eat without us anyway. Knives have been around the longest. Rabbit spoons came first. Stone Age people made spoons out of wood or bone to ladle their broth. And just how did they cut up whatever went into the broth? Damn spoon. Well, they needed spoons to stir the cooking, didn't they? Spoons were first. Knives. Spoon. Knives. Spoon. Knives. Spoon. Knives. Spoon. Knives. Spoon. Knives. Quiet! Knives were invented first. Spoons are close second. Right? Right. Well, <laughs> one thing for sure. Forks weren't invented till much later. Everyone knows it requires finesse and subtlety to invent a fork. Ooh. The ancient Romans used forks and they were a very civilised people. Ooh. Piers Gaveston, who lived in about 1320, had silver forks for eating pears. Ooh, silver for eating pears. Quiet! <laughs> Thank you. So you see, Zoe, nice forks and spoons have been around for centuries, although it was actually only about 300 years ago that most people started to use a complete set. And now I think there's just time for a quick burst of the cutlery chorus. Squat, fall, in! Some talk of new computers and some of microwave, of satellites and concord and robots who can shave. But of all my great inventions, there's none that can compare to the knife and the fork and the spoon we gave. Eat without us if you dare. first programme in the series, then you might recognise this letter from Jennifer Wilson from Armagh, and she wanted to know how a radio works. Well, we thought that seeing as this is the nearly the last programme of the series, then it's about time we told you. Well, Steve showed you earlier what sound waves look like when they've been turned into electrical signals with a microphone on the oscilloscope, and that is how a radio starts. In the radio studio, the DJ's voice or the record or whatever sound is turned into an electrical sound signal, which looks something like this. Now this sound signal isn't actually strong enough to leave the sound studio and go to your home so it has to be carried by another much stronger signal called a carrier signal and the carrier signal looks like this. Well you can see that it looks a bit like the sound signal but it's much closer together and that means it's much much stronger so it can carry the sound signal with it hundreds of miles and you can see the shape of the sound signal down there. And that is how the sound signal is carried to your radio. Now, different radio stations have all sorts of different sounds. Say this represented Radio 1, then this could represent Radio 2. And you can see that not only is the sound signal very different, but also the carrier. And remember, that's Radio 1, and that's Radio 2. Now, your radio has to tune in to the right signal from all the radio waves travelling through the air. And it does that through the aerial, and that's what you're doing when you're tuning your radio. You're picking up on the signal coming from the radio station. And that's how you can hear what's going on back at the radio studio. 
Hey, Sophie, Steve. Uh, yeah, Joe. You know you wanted to see um, something about my uh, perfect corner? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, here it is. Here you are. Well, it just looks normal, Joe. Aha. Uh -huh. But my perfect corner would have all my relatives come on a surprise visit, right? <laughs> and uh, the puzzle this week is to spot how many of you can see hiding, starting from now! <laughs> old grandpa up there. There's grandpa and there's a boy Joe, Uncle Henry up there. Uh, who's that? Oh, Molly Mop. Yeah. And Granny uh, and Bruce. Oh, and look. There's uh, Great Auntie Ali. Oh, yeah. And there's Charlotte and Ben. Oh. oh, and little Johnny with his bubble hat. Little Johnny. <laughs> and Daniel peeping round the tube. Oh. But Joe, where's your girlfriend? <laughs> you can <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Telephone, saved by the bell. <laughs> well, whoever it is that's phoning me now, don't no, don't phone me now. I'm in the middle of a junction. The cast of the satellite show appear in their own video in 25 minutes after today's edition of the Ewoks. Will you stop phoning, please?